Good to go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, Manuji asked me to say a few words about Hasselbrand and introduce a little bit um, the picture that came probably before all the amazing work you're about to see. I've taught two of those um, designers, and the third one has been a good friend and collaborator in the unit, so we all got to know each other quite a bit. Um, so that's why I thought I would give you maybe um, a bit of a secret glimpse in how I see their path in architecture and um, why I think it's exciting where it might go. So what's interesting to me is to think of an old Russian Soviet song, which we used to sing when we were little pioneers, you know, scary times. But it, it went on something like, what did you do today for tomorrow? And we were very little kind of studious little communists. We were very um, driven to kind of go along with that slogan. And so I would say what is interesting about Hasselbrandt is that they actually concerned themselves at that question when they were students here in A. What did I do today for my tomorrow? And it's not just like tomorrow's thoughts today, as Liam is great at, or uh, figuring out where my academic life might be, but actually where, where would I want to be as an architect, and how do I start working on it right now? So just like somehow I might say professors may find themselves in practice. They were students in practice. They started already thinking of how they want to work, who they want to work with, what connections they want to nurture, what projects they want to get. And they started doing all that while they were students at the AA. They started hiring their own friends and classmates, doing projects for uh, friends, relations, whatever. And meanwhile, they were also quite um, explicitly designing something which has become their ultimate project, their architectural practice, which I think is quite commendable at um, the stage when I've known, um, uh, known um, Martin and Jesper, which is their intermediate uh, unit work. So then what happens then with that sort of forward-minded outlook, they start rethinking what, how they might design that future. And here again, with a bit of bad humor, I'm thinking that, well, they must have some kind of an interesting breed of Scandinavian pragmatism, which is slightly different from the American version. And it's not just like thinking of things that are useful and lucrative, or just thinking about things that are kind of happening in the making. It's kind of the different Scandinavian pragmatism. It's some sort of blend between kind of a precise and direct, precise directness of Norwegian carpentry with a sort of intellectual promiscuity of Bjarke Ingels or something like that. So they've learned all those different triggers really well and they've put it to use and they started actually translating what they're thinking into what they might be making. And by, by that, I mean they probably started thinking a little bit ahead of how all that amazing research and ideas and thoughts that were coming through AA units, how all that lofty thinking and rethinking that we're teaching our students could actually be immediately connected to what we'll be making. And that's where the, I think that, sorry, Scandinavian pragmatism for me, it's very, I'm partly jealous, I'm partly mystified by it. They, they started putting it directly into practice. What they've started doing then, with a combination of this high and low, abstract and concrete ways of thinking, is that they started experimenting with space, the form, and what they would term a model. And here, I think, as a, as a teacher of architecture, I find it really fascinating that it suggests perhaps a different departure of both the means of practice and the, the end of our practices. So they're not just saying that we need to return to a disciplinary project of a type and a model, or abstraction of typology or production of endless rapid prototypes. Neither are they saying that somehow it's just a sidekick to a project where a diagram gets translated in design model or some kind of semi-formalized uh, knowledge of architecture and it's held dormant until it's ready to be deployed. Uh, to me, and this is again my personal read, 
I think that suggests potentially a different idea behind practice, that it's not particularly about translating just ideas into terminal buildings, but it's also at the same time abstracting and creating models at something that may be very concrete, legible, and real. And so as you look at the work, I would really like you to keep in mind that I think the real origin and ultimately the power, the kind of the ultimate destination of the work is, is beyond their concrete context. And somehow we should probably try to read where it might go beyond the specific individual space of the room or particular city, particular brief and site, and even beyond the field of just architecture as we, we conventionally circumscribe it. So welcome to A and uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, yeah, so we, um, we're called Hessebrand. Um, we're, a, we're a small architecture practice uh, working uh, uh, mostly in, uh, here in London and in Oslo. Um, um, tonight, uh, we're going to show you five projects. Uh, not all of them are buildings, but uh, some of them are more, let's say, moments of architecture. Uh, and that's uh, what we call a, a model. And the models are something that we return to over and over, and it's something that is um, very important for the way that we work, uh, because it sort of uh, gives us a way to, to keep on to the things that we care about, but also to move um, between different, ki different types of projects. Um, so the first project that um, I'm going to show you, it's, um, it's a commission. Uh, by the Review Gallery here in Soho, um, which was an exhibition of three uh, large-scale models. Uh, so the drawings here show uh, each, uh, each one of them. Uh, and the way that these work is like uh, they're almost found objects. So they, um, uh, they represent the space that we've uh, found in, a, in, in some kind of context and that we feel is important. Uh, sometimes the, the, these spaces can be very banal, or sometimes they are uh, completely accidental. But what they have in common is that they, uh, they provide these moments that change the way in which we relate to things around us. Um, so it, this is one of the models. Um, uh, so basically, uh, the way that this works is that you, uh, you can enter from the side. Um, and you can go inside of it. Um, it's a space that uh, gives you a sort of a, a private space within something that would otherwise, otherwise be much more public. Um, and from the outside, it appears to be, to be very closed, but uh, from the inside, you have a very spacious uh, type of environment. Um, and actually, we, we, we found these type of spaces um, uh, you know, almost a, like the inside of a, a taxi um, and, and, and sort of brought them out um, and translated them into an idea which we then give form. Uh, this here is the second one, which is the, the model which uh, works very much like a, like a wall. Um, and here we, we use many of the traditional elements that you would find in, in a wall, but uh, in a way, try to explore how it could create some depth. Um, a wall can, if, if you look closely, it can do so much more than divide two sides. Um, so, in order to understand, let's say, what, what these are, it's, uh, they're part of a, of, a, of a catalog that we're making. Um, it's a way for us to, uh, to capture moments uh, and, uh, let's say, organize the things that we are interested in. Uh, spatial ready-mades, uh, and it's uh, it's really through making these objects that they um, that they help us to uh, to understand and also to remind us what architecture is is actually about. Um, we did uh, for the exhibition uh, um, a very interesting collaboration with um, uh, OKRM and the Real Foundation. 
um, an ex let's say the exhibition design, which was really a way to to try to capture uh, the catalog as a as a one to one, so that you're actually uh, when you're in the space, you're also in the the catalog, which hopefully uh, comes out in the publication. Um, so yeah, this. Um, Maybe this image shows a bit what we were after. It's, it's um, let's say we form is the way in which we uh, can make sense of the world. It's, um, it is what gives meaning to an idea. Uh, and uh, for example, it, it's, it works very similar to the way that this color works. Uh, this, is, uh, this color is like the most overlooked, most, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, you, most common color that you would ever find, but but once you give it form, it immediately uh, is given a, a value, uh, and it also has, a, has an in incredible presence. Um, so yeah, this is the, the first project. Um, this is a, a sort of building. Um, it's for a, a school in in Aarhus in Denmark. Uh, which was a, a competition that we did. Um, Aarhus is a, is a very interesting city. Uh, you can see in the back the type of harbor front uh, developments that Denmark have become very famous for. Um, but our, this project is, is located in the darker corner here, uh, which is sort of the backwaters of the city, which in a way we were quite happy about. Because uh, instead of providing an end to the city, this was the moment for us to actually provide something that would be the beginning of something new. Um, so you can see here on the right, that's the, the plan of the building. Um, universities in Denmark uh, are incredibly public, uh, which is something that we really try to capture in this project. Um, and the, the school itself is about 12,000 square meters, and it, it consists of four uh, large volumes, which are intersected by these uh, halls, which are public spaces, um, or uh, public interiors, in fact. Um, so you can see here, um, let's say, uh, the plan uh, is, is very simple. It only consists of, of rooms. Um, in order to give it a very, uh, let's say, a very simple and flexible uh, space, um, the lack of, uh, of corridors uh, or cul-de-sacs is something that we've done very deliberately in order to to create overlaps and intersections, uh, and also to make use of all the space that you have in a, in a school like this, uh, so that you, you don't waste anything. Um, these uh, large halls is, is also what, what links all the, let's say, the school together, um, and, and all the unit spaces, which you see on the left, uh, have these large sliding doors, which, um, uh, let's say, allows the, um, uh, let's say, the, the studio, studio space and the public to or be in much more of a negotiation with each other. Uh, it allows the school to bleed into the space, but also for the public to actually see what the, what the school is doing. Um, and this, this kind of negotiation uh, also occurs in the, in the section, uh, where you see that you have the, say, the public spaces are the tall double-heighted one, or triple height, actually. Um, and then you have these uh, cores that intersect the studio so that every studio space then has a, let's say, a shared core. Um, so let's say um, what, one of the key things with this school was uh, to balance, uh, let's say, the relation between the private and the public. Uh, uh, and um, this was something that we really wanted to make explicit. Uh, so it sort of became the and let's say the force for what we wanted to do uh, in the representation. So the, the facade would take a, would take a form there where um, you see on the right, you have a, a very solid core, which is the, um, let's say a much more private entrance to the studios, where on the left you have a, a much more open, much more articulated public entrance uh, to the building. Um, yeah, so this is another project. This is, uh, it's quite similar, uh, but it's, uh, it's a, at a completely different site, uh, on a completely different scale. It's uh, here in London, uh, in East London. Uh, and um, it's the design for a, a shared workspace. Um, 
So um, it, uh, it's a conversion of an existing uh, warehouse, an old hat factory. Um, and uh, we've, we've done a lot of work on these types of buildings uh, because they're often vacant because of the, the depth of the plan, um, which is something that makes them very difficult um, to reuse or to appropriate for new things. Um, and, and we think it's really great because it poses some difficult questions and you have to come with some uh, unconventional solutions for it. Um, but let's say the, the client here is a, is a fashion designer who wanted to set up the space for his own company and also for um, other companies to join so that they could let's say, share a lot part of the infrastructure but also benefit from the way in which you can work together. Uh, um, often what happens when you do this uh, type of project is that you end up with a lot of small private studios and very, very long corridors. And we said from the beginning that this is something that we didn't want to do. Uh, we wanted to find a way where in which uh, rooms could be much more flexible. Because uh, what's typical for, let's say, smaller companies now is that they grow and they shrink very fast. So we had to find a system where in which you could uh, expand and contract uh, while at the same time um, have a lot of access to your neighbors. So we did a, uh, a system that's extremely simple. Uh, it's only walls and doors uh, that creates this um, let's say, system that uses the existing uh, column grid. Um, so what you get is basically um, spaces that fill up um, and connect to each other. Uh, so you have, um, let's say, uh, a studio space like this. Um, um, and what's typical here is that you have two windows. You have uh, one into the next uh, studio and one at the below. Um, and this is so, you, uh, so that you can get a sense, even though you're in your, let's say, individual studio, you still get a sense of what's happening around you so that you're, you can feel that you're part of, um, of a larger building. Um, as I said, uh, the studio has uh, two walls and two sliding doors. <clears throat> and this is also that... Uh, when you use it, it's also something that you can calibrate, uh, let's say, the, the level of, of connection that you want uh, to your neighbors. Um, at the, let's say, at the first phase of the, <clears throat> the project, uh, the studio wasn't, wasn't going to be uh, filled up with, with uh, office space. So um, what we did was to divide the half of the space um, simply by, by closing the doors uh, and thereby creating um, a gallery space at the... Uh, let's say the front of the building, um, and here you see how, let's say the circulation uh, goes between room, uh, between room and room, and in the middle you have this hallway, uh, which is um, a type of semi-public space that uh, every studio can use, but it's also something that can be, uh, let's say, rented out um, as a way to make, as a full use of, of um, all your square meters. Um, so, yes, this is a, another project, slightly different from the last one, um, where, let's say, this, this is not about square meters, uh, not at all, um, much more about the, about the volume. Uh, it was uh, also a commission uh, to do a, um, say a, a freestanding pavilion in the north of England. Um, it's probably the hardest project we've done so far. Um, simply because uh, it was to, I said, the brief was to design a, a building without a program, which put some very interesting, uh, say, questions for us, and it's something that has, we've learned a lot from and, and work a lot with now. Um, here you see the this is the site plan. Uh, the building is the the black rectangle at the top. Um, so it sits uh, within this uh, very well designed garden. Uh, amongst a series of 18th century buildings. Um, and in, uh, in plan, it, it mirrors the conservatory that you see on the left um, in order to emphasize, let's say, the view out towards the woods from the, from the main building. But uh, let's say, as a, as a building, it works uh, very, very different, differently. Um, unlike, the, let's say, the surrounding buildings where the structure and the, and the meaning is all placed on the facade, here, the, the building, uh, let's say, is inverted. So all the, let's say, structure, service, and space is uh, placed on these two cores. Um, uh, it's a very, structure, uh, let's say, a very simple uh, principle. 
where uh, say the, the cores sit directly uh, on the floor plates, which also acts as the main foundation. And then you have the, the roof, which uh, rests upon these and are, uh, let's say, um, piercing through the, the roof in order to let uh, daylight in. Um, so this is part of the, let's say, the study of, of these, uh, the cores. And um, what, say what's important is that the, the, the shape that they take is not, uh, let's say, the result of, of their um, uh, how do they, load bearing capacities. It's uh, much more about the, the type of space that they create. Um, and here we were equally, uh, let's say, invested in what the negative form in between the cores uh, do as, as the actual physical form. Um, here you see the plan. Um, so yeah, the, you have these two cones um, that holds basically the, the service. So you have a kitchen and a bathroom. Um, and they say the, the form that they take um, is, a, is a way to, to uh, eliminate the use of uh, corners so that uh, it's very difficult uh, to say where, where it uh, begins and where it ends. And it's also a way to make they, the use of the building uh, much more defined by the, the space it takes rather than uh, the functions it has. Here you see it uh, from the woods looking towards the, the house. And this is the other way, looking towards uh, the woods. Um, this is a room. Um, it's, a, it's a room that's been uh, very, very important to us. Uh, and it has taught us a lot uh, about architecture. Um, it's a very common situation now that uh, people in London find themselves in. Um, and what, what, you, what you see is uh, the room is on the one uh, at the bottom. Um, it's a condition where basically the entire sphere of life has collapsed on the room. Um, and it, it, it uh, let's say, it really makes no difference between what is life and what is work anymore. Uh, but more, let's say, or most importantly, um, in this type of uh, living conditions, you, you have no uh, possibility to share anything whatsoever. Uh, and this, this, it's a very problematic situation. Um, and it's something we've experienced very firsthand. And it has inspired us a lot in what we are working on uh, when we are working on housing, which is um, a big part of our, our practice. Um, this is uh, a housing project. Um, it's, a, it's a proposal for, for a, um, a project in West London, uh, where we, uh, we bring elderly and young uh, together, um, not only because they're the two fastest growing groups in society, but also because there's something uh, very interesting that occurs architecturally when you, when you put these two groups together. Uh, and it raises some very interesting questions about um, what it means to live both, both uh, together and also apart. So this building uh, is, um, is a you can see you have the residential block uh, which sits on a, on a sunken plinth. Um, and it's the, the plinth uh, creates a, a public uh, plaza towards the front. Um, below the ground, you, you have uh, public amenities. So you have a swimming pool and a, and a shared working space. And then you have, uh, let's say, the joint between the, um, the, the slab and the plinth is, uh, is a lobby and a, and a pub. Um, however, what we, want, what we didn't want to do is what often happens is when uh, let's say, uh, commercial functions come too close to the street is that they start to, to take over the, the public space. So, so what we did is to set it back. Uh, so in fact, you get a very clean uh, facade towards the, towards the street. Um, here you can see the, the typical plan of the, of the living units. Towards the sides, you have uh, two uh, circulation cores. Um, and then you, uh, say, you have a shared balcony which is also acts as the entrance to your house. Um, every, in front of every unit, you have a little niche 
which becomes your, let's say, your private spot on this shared space. Um, it's also to emphasize this that uh, you, you live amongst others, but you're also, you also have your own. Um, and here we are inside uh, the smallest unit. Uh, there are two units in this, in, in this plan. Um, and, and here what, we, what we've done be, is because we worked with the, uh, the smallest uh, let's say space standard that you can do, uh, is to eliminate all service and, uh, and uh, corridor spaces so that no matter where you are in, inside of the, the, the apartment, uh, you can get a sense of the, the whole space. Uh, it's also something that uh, makes the plan much uh, flexible in a different way because it makes it a lot more open for interpretation. Um, so here uh, you have this ledge running on the right side of the apartment. Um, which is the, a table almost that, that is part of the architecture that runs all the way throughout the space. Um, and, it's, and it continues all the way to the back to where the, where the sleeping area is. Um, and it's, it acts as a way for us to, to think of these things much more uh, spatially rather than uh, through their function. Um, so the way that we, we design when we do this is to to ask, uh, say, questions of light and dark, soft and hard, wet and dry. Uh, and it gives a sort of unexpected, uh, um, unexpected results. And, it, and, and we hope also that uh, it, it almost pushes the ones who, who use the apartment to actually questions how, question how you want to live yourself. Um, what you see here is, uh, is an alternative, I say the, the larger version um, what, and it's what happens when you take out one of the, the let's say, uh, wet cores in the, in the middle. You connect two units, um, but what happens is that you don't get a, just a double amount of space, but uh, instead you get this diagonal through, throughout the, the apartment. So in a sense, you still have only uh, a single room, but within it you have a, a much more, let's say, um, a multitude of spaces. Um, What's also important is the way in which these things are proportioned is, um, and let's say the, the way that we are dimensioning the, uh, the spaces is that, uh, uh, yeah, you can see in the, in the image and also to the right in the plan that what used to be a shower uh, can also now be turned into a small study. Um, so it allows the space to, to not be, uh, let's say, too tied to its original purpose. Uh, here you see a model, uh, a model of the, say the unit, and it's uh, as a form. It's it's, it's quite simple, um, but we um, we work a lot in in models, uh, both physical and uh, and three dimensional. Um, it's because we have to understand the project through its volume, um, and it's also uh, as I say in. Uh, today, it's, it's a space that's m much more difficult to quantify, so it gives us a lot of space to actually design. Um, okay, this is, the, this is the last project. This is the, for those who haven't been uh, uh, in Venice, it's the British Pavilion, uh, which we did a, a project inside of for this uh, Biennale. Um, this is inside the pavilion. Um, the Biennale originally was, a, was only for art, um, which is a way, uh, say, where you move through a space around objects or you observe things from a distance. And uh, when the architecture Biennale sort of attached, um, it more or less adopted the same format. Uh, so we used the same way of, of, of uh, showing our work. And when we, when we were approached with this project, we said that we, we didn't want to do this. Uh, we, we didn't want to design a show where, let us say, a show that was about architecture, but we wanted it to, to be architecture. Um, so you can say, if art gives us a moment outside of the everyday, uh, for us, architecture is uh, the means that organizes it. Uh, and the task for us then became like, how can we then bring the everyday down to Venice? Um, this, is, uh, this is inside of the pavilion when we, when we got it. Um, it it's, a, 
it's a villa with very tall ceiling heights and these rather grand uh, 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 ceiling lights. Uh, and it, it looks quite different from what an everyday situation in London uh, usually looks like. So um, we had to figure out how to make, uh, make it disappear. Uh, so we painted it black as, a, as a, our first move. Um, and then we, uh, we built this um, as a, a wall along the, uh, that, the, that would uh, stick out in around 50 centimeters from, from the existing building that would be white. Uh, and this allowed us uh, a completely different uh, liberty in designing actually the plan of this building. Um, and we could, we could sort of assess every room by itself. Um, this wall also then was able to contain all the services and everything that we needed in order to create uh, a domestic environment. So when, when the, I say this, the height of this then would actually create a sort of visual datum uh, because the building was black, uh, and we now we, we blacked out all the skylights, uh, and then we we also built these um, uh, windows inside of the wall, uh, these light windows, uh, which uh, let the light come in from the side the same way that it would do in a house. Uh, and then uh, for for each room, we we worked with um, different artists and architects who done a, a research project on the theme of the Biennale, and we had to figure out a way to design, design these projects into, the, into the, whole, the whole exhibition. Uh, and we also said from the beginning that we, we, were not in, we didn't find it very interesting to just show objects or individual projects in each room. So we had to find a way to tie the whole thing together. And we did this um, through using a, a very strict uh, material uh, palette we used on the MDF, uh, it's a very special uh, M pigmented MDF that has uh, this kind of quite abstract uh, appearance to it. Um, and this was, um, we said, if we want to show these projects, not as representations, but actual projects, um, we'll, we'll, we'll make them as models. Um, so they are uh, even detailed here the same way you would make a 1 to 100 model. Um, and then, uh, each project had a different uh, had different colors depending on what they did, but but they it created a continuity throughout the entire pavilion, um, and it was it was a very very complicated thing to to do because these are actually buildings and we had to prefabricate them here in in uh, in Britain uh, and then ship them down to Venice and uh, have them installed together with the wall that was built locally. Um, which required a, 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 an incredible task and coordination for all the people that, that were involved. Um, so th these are uh, photographs by Thomas Adank, a uh, Swiss photographer who, who um, I think captured the, the, the project in a very, in a very nice way. Um, you can see uh, it's sort of uh, something that is both literal and abstract at the same time. Uh, because what we wanted was not to, to, uh, to tell the visitor how to use the space, but actually to go in and, and, and almost explore, but, uh, and also to think about what is, what is this space actually about. Um, and yeah, here we can see the, here you can see the white wall uh, that's coming off of the existing building, uh, and then with the, let's say, the MDF models that are sort of pushing into the wall uh, where they needed to, because all, many of these projects were not singular buildings, but they were part of a system that should be repeated. Um, uh, yeah, I think that this, the, uh, these images, they, they show something that we, we liked a lot with this, was the, the type of scalelessness that, uh, that occurs uh, when you hit the, the right level of abstraction. Uh, and it makes you, you think, uh, or it's also almost hard to tell if it's real or if it's, if it's not. I think this, this sums up a lot of what, or what we are doing now and, and where we are as a practice. Thank you.
questions from the audience? Hi. Um, I really enjoyed the lecture. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how your models that you mentioned uh, at the start of the lecture, how they feed into your like built work, your practice. And just if you can elaborate a bit more on the relationship between that abstract realm and then the very real. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, for us, the, <coughs> the the project, which is Hasselbrand, is more important than the, the object. So, so the, the models, uh, the way we describe them, um, they, um, and they, they represent uh, an, a spatial idea that's given a certain form, but it, they are not sort of perhaps they approach an ideal, but, but we are well aware of that idea not being something that we can reach, which allows it to evolve with various circumstances. So they become a way of thinking, a way of cataloging ideas, and then we bring them with us. We bring them with us to different sites, to different situations, and uh, and they their potential for evolution is through the form. An incredibly clear presentation. Congratulations. Now, the first project you showed was in Aarhus, yes, in Denmark? Yes. Right. I mean, I have to ask a very pragmatic question. How did you build it? Were you in conjunction with another large practice, or was it just you and your friends? That is a substantial building. So the, um, the building in Aarhus is, uh, is only on a competition stage and unfortunately not a one competition. Um, so it's, um, it is, let's say, for now only on paper. But the important thing there is, um, as Martin also mentioned, and as the, let's say, the title of the lecture um, entails, is that any project, if it's built or not, it's, um, of course, the built project is the, the final output, in a way, for a particular project. But the model is something that can be built or non, not built, it doesn't really matter for the model itself. So I would say like that project, for instance, it's, it's, um, we worked on a lot of different ideas that could be built in one way or another. No, I, I just got to congratulate you because, you know, looking at that narrative and looking at the model, okay, I was there. So, you know, congratulations. And we, we spent last week talking about the work of Cedric Price and the notion of the built and the unbuilt. So, uh, you know, as you say, we're, we're thinking and building thoughts. So, uh, yeah, for me, absolutely convincing. Thank you. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, thank you for, for the lecture. Uh, I had a question regarding a sort of realm of thought and design that perhaps that was not mentioned in the lecture but uh, is very very prominent I think in some ways and it's the question of style and I would be curious to hear you elaborate a little bit about perhaps your internal either alignment or struggles um, and your future predictions on your on your practice in regard to this idea of style well I don't know. Um, I would say internally, we style is not really a. Um, it's it's not a word that we. It doesn't really come up uh, in 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 our work when we when we discuss what we're doing. Um, also, what's really what's really um, important, I think, for us is to to be three individuals when we design. All the design work we do is, is done together, basically. And then we can run different projects on our own. But um, 
but everything that is actual design is a discussion between between the three of us and um, let's say all our differences and uh, you know different uh, ideas uh, we always we always uh, talk about them and try to find out which ones are good and which ones are bad and uh, which ones we uh, can build on let's say yeah of course we you know we we have we have a general taste, you know, there are certain things that we like and there are certain things that we dislike. But I think um, when we work, we always try to understand why and how to make space. And uh, it, it comes down to some, I mean, we're not 100% rational beings. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we allow a certain, let's say, intuition uh, to be part of that process. And maybe, you know, by chance, this intuition aligns uh, on certain levels, and of course not always, and not 100%. But uh, for us, it's, uh, it's more thinking about something and understanding not uh, only how it should be done, but also why we are doing it, and also why we think the way we do about certain things. But, but I think also it, it, this type of operation is, is a way to, to avoid relying too much on, on taste, which I guess, uh, at least to, to me, is a lot attached to, to style. Um, because what we, I think we all feel a great suspicion about uh, good taste, because it's very hard to, to control, especially in the, the time that we are in now. So, um, say, we try to never think that we are doing the right thing, uh, and thereby always, uh, let's say, fight in order to propose the least bad version. Uh, so that we, 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 we never believe in that we are doing the, 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 the right choice. Um, Any other questions? Thank you very much. Um, I'm just kind of curious about the future of, of the project Hesse Brand. Where, where, where do you see it going or where would you ideally see it going uh, from here? I think it's a very interesting um, start. I think, I think we, all, <laughs> we all, we have this discussion a lot. Uh, we, we are, we're not really sure. Uh, but the one thing we're sure about is that we, we want to make uh, buildings. It's, uh, there's no doubt. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a very tricky time to, to work in for many reasons. Uh, and especially when you're, when you're a young practice, uh, it, it's very hard to actually get to get opportunities to, to build things. So we are uh, trying our way around. Um, and it's also part of the way that we've designed, uh, let's say, our projects, but also how we design them, the way that we work. We, we move along, around a lot and try not to rely too much on, on let's say, contexts or, or physical locations. And I think what, what we really are interested in and what, as Jesper says, we, we, don't, we don't really know where we're going. But the, I think the one thing that we know is that we want to, to really work with architecture. And, and that might seem obvious, but it's, it's not an easy thing to do in a way. I, I, there's a lot of distractions and sidetracks which touch upon like architecture as a subject. Um, but really to work with, with space, like properly with space, um, and pursue that, um, I think that, that's, that's probably the only thing we can say that we really want to do. Um, yeah. You're staying true to that calling, <laughs> no matter what you're saying, because you've alluded to the difficulties that inevitably accompany anybody who wants to actually practice architecture. Hi. Um, I was wondering, as a young practice, I think you sometimes face the question of survival. Have you ever rejected a commission or turned down? Where do you draw the line? For example, let's say, I'm not going to do this, or I'm going to do, uh, let's say, these type of projects, these type of programs, or was you, for example, right now, specifically say we want to challenge, <coughs> we want to face challenges that are spatial, but sometimes you might get a commission that the challenge is not necessarily in the spatial um, quality of it. 
Yeah, of course, that's that's very much a part of of our everyday uh, in the in the practice. I mean, uh, I think one of our, I mean, the the, fir the first place we start is is to to really talk about how we can define a certain autonomy in in the project, because we realize that it's impossible for us to control every facet of it. I mean, it's it's. Uh, we we are not in that position, and uh, then with with a certain amount of uh, you know reason we we decide whether or not to pursue that level of autonomy or to let it go. And and there's been times where you know uh, we've we've uh, you know chosen to to go elsewhere and and to really try to focus our attention on certain things that is meaningful to to us. But I was <clears throat> well, the one thing to add to that is that uh, we sort of made a or let's say the models that we work with have allowed us to make a kind of compromise, um, which allows us to take on projects that might not be um, all that interesting in their their wholeness, because buildings are not necessarily architecture. That's the the problem. Um, so what we've done is to figure out how to practice architecture within buildings. So it's, that's why we, these are sequences or moments that we work with. Um, so you, you have to l learn how to give up certain things and, and, uh, and thereby, let's say, put your heart in where it matters. Um, I guess I really like that quote that buildings aren't necessarily architecture and like kind of how you find the architecture in a building. but. Um, I was actually quite curious to have you guys speak about how you started the practice itself. I think unlike any of the other people who've been part of the What's Next series, you, you started your practice as students. And I think I'll, what we usually ask people who come in to do this is what ideas were embedded in their student projects that led to their practice. So I guess I was curious about what was the urgency that made you want to start a practice while you were still studying here? Um, and what was it like to be working on a kind of on a series of academic projects, and then also on, and then tr translating those same ideas into the world of practice. Well, yeah, in a, in a way, I, I think um, it, it started, everything started quite accidentally, in a way, um, because we, we realized we work really well together, and, um, um, and especially that's based on like having good discussions, I'd say, being able to like talk about um, architecture on a level which where you can be like completely honest and there's no one no one gets offended I think people believe we we argue when we discuss sometimes um, but um, then also since we started early it was also a um, this way of thinking even though it wasn't defined as models the way we talk about models today it started very early on as well like when we were doing our academic projects they also became models for what we were building the practice around. So even though the, the projects we were doing in, in, um, in uh, well, academically were of a different, very different nature of what we would do professionally, they would still, we would still work with the same kind of ideas and you know, the same, uh, um, same approach to, to space. We, we also found ourselves uh, in a situation where we, where we didn't really like what most people were doing. We, uh, when we started, we, we were, um, got really engaged in these issues that had to do with how we live in the, uh, in the city. Um, and there were a few, uh, few interesting alternatives. Um, so it was also uh, out of a kind of necessity, I, I think. Yeah. And also, you know, in the, let's say if, if there's such a thing as, you know, purely academic side and then practice, I mean, I think that uh, what we felt in many ways was that the, the academic world was just like perpetually expanding and expanding and going as, you know, as, as far as it could. While in the practice side, in a way, so it's about trying to figure out how to be precise about something and can be really minute detail. Uh, but but to, to bring those worlds together was just uh, you know an incredible you know place for discovery of ideas and and we, we don't believe that ideas is something that you have I mean if you if you do that's that's great but we, we, we want to work in order to develop 
ideas and, and to, to have those two worlds, you know, bounce, bounce off each other is, um, is um, fantastic. If I can ask the question myself, um, I guess it's not a question more of a comment, but I think what Manuji brought up is actually a very important set of issues, which is um, in today's times, we've all alluded to all kinds of difficulties that surround us today in London, you know, Europeans in London, I shouldn't be here anyway. Um, it seems to me that we are going through a series of trial times for architectural practices. So, you know, if we're not practicing at a time of excess or even abundance, that we need to be extremely elastic and adaptable and proactive and entrepreneurial with how we work. And so what I think is interesting to note is their ability to recognize that if they don't pounce on a possibility and make the most of it, redesign how they term things. And I think that this is where it, an interesting question comes up is perhaps you don't even accept the boundaries of what architectural education is supposed to be or what so-called practical training is supposed to be or why is it such a thing called an internship versus directing of a practice. So because you've overwritten and kind of decided to script your own biographies, you in a way stirred up a lot of really interesting questions in the way how architects get educated or if the architects in fact practice while or prior their education. The questions, your questions as students uh, when you already entered the world of practice became extremely focused and you actually had an urgent need to know certain things and you had an urgency to define a solution that is distinct from a theoretical formula or a very kind of expedient practical solution. So to me, again, as a primarily teacher of architecture, that is a fantastic experiment and a prodding to all of us to reconsider that these roles and those so-called phases of our training and growth do not need to be like everyone else's. And we need to take that project creatively. So I wonder if you, would you've done something differently or are you happy? It's some, something from you to react to that as a kind of innovation. Would you have started earlier no, I, or I, later? I, I don't know. I don't think we could have. Uh, um, I think it just happens, really. And then, yeah. and then you have to. Uh, the, most, the, the important thing is to you know is uh, don't uh, not take things for granted uh, and question even even more success, really, because uh, um, I think we also had so much failure. Um, we had so much failure, so we learned a lot in the beginning. Because um, that's the, you always learn more when you when you fail. Um, so maybe if we could do something differently, maybe we could have failed, failed more. Yeah. <laughs> 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 learned more by failing more. <laughs> Sorry, this is like becoming a conversation between yeah. me and Rohan. Um, but I. I guess like when you when Martin responded to that question, it made me think because I guess we've had conversations about the AA being an incubator, setting up an incubator for emerging practices. And I think in your guys' case, the AA was an incubator for your practice because you were still students. So having failure or giving yourself the, the time to fail and learn from those failures happened while you were students. So by the time you graduated, you'd already been a practice for a certain amount of time in a way. And I never really thought of it that way until you said that just now. And I think there's a, a model in there that could be, um, taken on by more people perhaps, that how do you start to blur, blur these boundaries a bit more between academia and practice? And how do you, like, how could this theory of an incubator stop being something that you do after you graduate, but be moved maybe into what academia is? That, I mean, I think I keep saying that the AA has always been quite an entrepreneurial place, and it's quite strange that in recent years a lot of people leave the AA and try and pursue quite a traditional career path that you would do if you came out of another school. But he, usually here, I think Valentin said once that you were forced to be entrepreneurial because you weren't trained to work for someone else. You were trained to just, you know, take your ideas and become an amazing architect. So you had to just start your own thing. And nowadays maybe less so. And so how do we bring back some of that entrepreneurial ambition today. I mean, that's the whole reason why the series was set up, actually, to encourage students to take the ideas they're thinking about at day and turn them into a form of practice and to use graduates as an example. So I guess I would just be curious on, because you're looking at all these models of architecture, how your model of practice could potentially become something, as Maria is saying, that's redefining 
boundaries or terms or even stages of, pra of like part one, part two, part three? Mm. Mm. I don't know if you guys have had a discussion about that. Yeah, a lot actually. Sure. Uh, and yeah, but, but also the other way around. Um, it's also about the, let's say, learning how the world works when you're in school, uh, but also to <laughs> kind of stay in school when you're out of it. Um, because what we, we feel a lot is that you, you go through uh, school and you do all these amazing, uh, often research, uh, but then it sort of cut short because you start working. Um, so for us, uh, this was also a way to, in a way, stay in school. And this also, we worked with Ma Maria uh, since, oh well, actually, we worked when we were still in school. Mm. Uh, and this has allowed us to actually maintain this type of thinking and, and, uh, and combine it with practice. So what we are very interested in finding ways where, as as a professional, you can also, uh, say, remain in academia. Um, and I, th I think that's really that's something we discuss a lot, and which we find very important and interesting. That, let's say, we obviously we go through different phases where like students, and then we're we're professionals somehow, but and we're part one, part two, part three, etc. But the really important thing is to to really keep trying new things and like trying and not being afraid of failing for instance of being like taking on like larger things than you think you can for instance um, because what we see of course is like when when you graduate like a lot of a lot of work becomes very um, um, I don't know everything is done by protocol basically you know exactly how to do thing something because the Reba says it or someone else says it or you know it's like how things are supposed to be done but I think that's very limiting and it's it's like it's very far away from what we do here at the AA. Um, so we really tr we try to not get into, let's say, that kind of protocol, very professional way of working, but try to remain students in that sense. Um, and, well, I, I think that the real way of, of maybe, you know, having um, an incubator would be on to, towards both sides. It would be, because it's equally important for the the professionals as to the to the to the uh, academic side. Um, yeah. Very straightforward question, but it, it keeps coming up that uh, you started your practice as students, and I was wondering which were the projects or what kind of projects were you doing as a student in your practice? Um, well, we did uh, both competitions and commissions. Actually, it was, uh, it was quite funny. One of the, I think it was the second project that we did, which uh, stopped, uh, just began yesterday. So, uh, yeah, we, we started off by uh, doing very small projects, um, whatever we could find, really. Under the last project that you uh, created some space that is like an abstract art, but I found some photos are taken from a very specific point of view that may not be found by common people, and you take many efforts to build off this. So I just want to know the necessity to uh, build something that may not be felt by many people, but you have to uh, uh, take every effort to build. So is it so necessary to do th these things that... Uh, Are you, you're referring to the, to the last... The, the last home? project, yeah. Right, because right. some point of view is not so common. It's uh, very low. Right. Uh, yeah. I think that not many people can mm -hmm. felt that uh, point of view right. to find what you want to show. Mm. But it takes you many efforts to build these things. Mm. So, and yeah, now you also you, you tap into something which is very essential to the way we work and have been working since day one, and which is through collaborations. I mean, we we love to surround ourselves with people that you know want to engage in these types of discussions, and we. We really, you know, we want to hear what they have to say and what they have to offer. I mean, in the case of the home economics, I mean, these photographs were, were taken by 
uh, an artist, and um, and uh, we, you know, uh, or uh, the way that that project was structured from from all sides really was to to create room for people to interpret the work and to engage with the work in the way that they they felt was uh, you know appropriate and the way they wanted to have a, a stake in the project, a voice in the project. Um, and and uh, I mean, going into a discussion about image making, it's, it's um, when we work on the hands on, on, on the image, it's, um, it's a really a, a painstakingly slow process in many ways in order to try to figure out how to communicate a spatial idea um, which might result in something which is you know, conventional and straightforward, but also which is unexpected. Thank you. I have a question that ties a bit to this, um, because I'm thinking of uh, the abs abstraction of the aesthetics which are tied to the model making and which is also, in a way, tied to the one-to-one -one model making in, uh, for instance, in the Soho Review Gallery, um, where it seems that the abstraction of the aesthetics um, becomes a way of both articulating um, that this is not a, a finished form, it's not something which is, in a way, uh, it's, it's always in progress, and also, uh, to me, uh, that, that kind of abstraction um, uh, I, I'm just wondering is, is it is it to um, uh, somehow talk more about the spatial qualities itself rather than to to reference something else or to or what what are these uh, what, what is this kind of abstraction uh, as an aesthetic um, approach uh, doing to the to the models you do and to the, to the projects you, you, you make uh, it, it's only about space the, the way that we choose these things or treat them um, has only been to express the space. There, um, there, there's no other meaning to it. Um, but you could say that today it's often very hard to find the architecture in, in images. Um, it's often so uh, filled with stuff that has nothing to do with it. Um, so here we, we did the, the exact opposite. Um, and it's also it's true what you're saying, it's, it's very much in the middle of the process um, because that's how it exists for us most of the time. Um, so I guess uh, for the one in, in Soho, it was a way to almost allow or to see what happened when people entered into the stage that we uh, feel the most comfortable in. And, <coughs> and there as well, the abstraction becomes very important as, um, as a way of understanding the idea of the space. And that space could be made in many different ways, in many different materials, construction principles, scale, a lot of, you know, there's so many different parameters. But the, um, for at least for ourselves, like what these models, these kind of models, what they allow us is to, to really put space to the idea that we have and make that as clear as possible. Um, sorry, just, um, just in the interest of uh, time, I think we're gonna have to wrap up the questions there, but you can continue asking them questions more informally. There's drinks in the South Jury Room for everyone. And um, yeah, I guess we'd just like to thank the three of you for coming in today and speaking to everyone. And thank you everyone for coming.